that I Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, you have joined the US Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board or CSB's business meeting. We will now begin this meeting with Dr. Catherine Lamos, the chairperson and CEO of the CSB. Good morning. You've joined the US Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board's or CSB's business meeting. We will now begin this meeting um, by thanking everyone that has joined our quarterly business meeting. They're a great opportunity to provide an update on CSB progress and activities. Today I'm joined uh, virtually by board members, Dr. Sylvia Johnson and Mr. Stephen Owens, Susan Kantrowitz, Managing Director, David Lasser, Senior Advisor, Executive Council and Acting General Counsel. Bruce Walker, Senior Advisor. Stephen Kleist, Executive Director of Investigations and Recommendations. Chuck Barbie, Director of Recommendations. And Mark Kasniak, Recommendations Specialist. Allow me to first summarize the mission of the CSB we are an independent, non-regulatory federal agency with a mandate to investigate accidental chemical releases at fixed facilities with significant impact to the safety of on-site workers, community members, and our environment. The investigations examine and evaluate a wide range of aspects to include equipment and system design, regulations, industry standards, and guidance, training operations and procedures, and human and organizational factors. With the facts, we conduct analysis to determine the probable cause and the contributing factors. This way we can better understand not just what happened, but why. We issue safety recommendations for the purpose of preventing the likelihood and consequence of similar incidents in the future. The purpose of today's business meeting is to provide stakeholders and the general public with insight and transparency into the business of the CSB and meeting our mission. So allow me to walk through today's agenda. I will start by introducing our new board members Senior Advisor and Executive Counsel David Lassert will then provide some critical administrative and strategic updates that impact the agency's performance. Executive Director Kleist will review our updated goals for completing open investigations posted quarterly on our website. Director Barbie will present an update to the summary statistics for recommendations we first presented in January. These statistics clearly highlight the success of the CSB in meeting its mission through recommending and advocating for positive safety change. And through this data, he will reinforce why safety recommendation status is a key indicator of performance for our agency. We will continue to build on these statistics and include this as a routine segment of our quarterly meetings. In addition to summary statistics and an overview of new recommendation status changes voted on by the board since our previous business meeting, Director Barbie and Mr. Kasniak have identified and will highlight for you some of the new safety recommendation status changes given their unique contributions to safety. Senior Advisor and Executive Counsel David Lesurk will then share some recent accomplishments of the communications and an animations teams. In addition to the animation for Edward Green that we released earlier this month, I believe several weeks ago, we have a new animation to showcase today. These products have significant impact in sharing lessons learned to promote a higher level of chemical safety. So before we get started, if you haven't already seen our web or our email notice, I'd like to highlight that we have a board meeting a week from today 
to review and vote on the Loy Lang box company incident that occurred in St. Louis, Missouri in March of 2017. There are many more board meetings to come as Executive Director Kleist will share with you. And as with the three board meetings held in FY21 or fiscal year 21, we anticipate these will be held virtually. All will be accessible to the public live as well as posted for later viewing on our website. So new board members, allow me to be the first to welcome member Owens and member Johnson to their first quarterly business meeting as newly confirmed members of the CSB. So member Stephen Owens brings years of experience and expertise in environmental law and government to his term as CSB board member. He most recently practiced environmental safety and health law in Phoenix, Arizona. During the Obama administration, he served as the US Environmental Protection Agency or EPA's Assistant Administrator for the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. This was a position he was appointed to by President Barack Obama. Prior to serving at EPA, member Owens was director of the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Member Owens also served as chief counsel and then state director for Senator Al Gore in the US Senate. And before that, as counsel to the subcommittee on investigations and oversight of the US House Committee on Science and Technology. Welcome, Member Owens. Thank you. Member Johnson has more than two decades of experience in the health and safety field. She began researching chemical exposures when a doctoral student at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. Member Johnson's professional experience includes investigating industrial manufacturing accidents, hazard recognition and mitigation, and understanding the connections between government agencies and the public's health and safety. She spent five and a half years as an occupational epidemiologist in the health and safety department before the International Union, United Automobile, Aerospace and Agricultural Implement Workers of America, or UAW. Member Johnson spent four years with the National Education Association, or NEA, and was part of NEA's health and safety team tasked with developing COVID-19 mitigation strategy recommendations to safety, to safely reopen school buildings. As you can tell, they come with a wealth of experience because that was a lot Lots of bringing to the table. <laughs> um, so we're fortunate, we're really fortunate, I'm super pleased to add their diverse perspectives to our agency in furtherance of our mission. So I'd like to now allow for each of the members, the new members to have a moment of personal privilege to address the business meeting. Member Owens, welcome. Well, thank you, Chairman Lindlison, for the opportunity to say a few words. I just want to introduce myself as you did. I'm Steve Owens, uh, for the benefit of everyone um, who are joining us virtually here today, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I want to start, first of all, by expressing my appreciation once again to President Biden uh, for appointing me to the Chemical Safety Board. It's really a great honor to be a member of this board. Uh, in the three months that I've been on the job, we've been working hard together to try to address a number of the issues that are facing the Chemical Safety Board, including how to reduce the backlog of open investigations and close out a number of recommendations, as well as how to improve the processes and procedures of the Chemical Safety Board. Um, it's clear that we've got a long way to go, but in my opinion, at least, we're off to a pretty good start so far. And Chairman Lehman, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, uh, to work uh, on all of those issues with you and uh, Member Johnson. Um, I also want to say what a real privilege it is to work alongside all the incredibly hardworking and talented career employees of the Chemical Safety Board. You know, they are really the backbone of this agency, uh, and I want to publicly thank them for all the hard work and for their dedication um, to the public service and for everything that they are doing to make the work of this agency a success. 
you know, because we're short staff, the current employees of the board have been uh, doing some extra heavy lifting uh, in recent days, uh, and we need to get them some help as quickly as we can. Uh, you know, in fact, not too long ago, uh, this agency had nearly 50 employees with roughly 20 investigators. Uh, today, uh, we have only 33 people, including three of us as board members uh, and only 12 investigators. Uh, and as, as we all know, this is a very small agency, but it has a very big job. But even with all the challenges that have faced the Chemical Safety Board over the years and are currently facing us now as board members, the Chemical Safety Board has been doing incredibly important work to help protect communities, workers, and the environment from chemical disasters. Uh, and finally, to everyone who is um, participating in this, meet this meeting virtually today, I want to say thank you for your involvement. Uh, your involvement in the work of the Chemical Safety Board is absolutely critical uh, to this agency. Uh, and so thank you again, Chairman Lemos, to say a few words, and I'll turn it back over to you. You're on mute, Chairman. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Member Owens. I appreciate the, the words. And yes, we I, I would wanted to say earlier that I've enjoyed so much. Um, and I think we've made progress in the first several months. Um, and I'd also say that the staff has provided a heavy lift uh, for, for a long time now. <laughs> um, yeah. Because we have uh, staffed up, uh, um, been staffing up and and we have more to go but thank you for highlighting that because it's the staff that we rely on to put our product together and to really do the the day in day out work um at this time i'd also like to allow member johnson a moment of per personal privilege member johnson welcome thank you thank you madam chair um i would like to start by thanking president biden for entrusting me and appointing me to the Chemical Safety Board, and I look forward to our work ahead. And I'd also like to echo the sentiments that my colleagues have just expressed about the hard work of the employees of the Chemical Safety Board. Um, in the two short months I've been here, I've seen how dedicated they are to this work, and I am excited to be here, and I look forward to working with the staff um, I do want to say that for me, uh, workplace safety and health is personal in that I witnessed my mother and so many like her become ill and die from what I suspected was occupational related. My mother was only 61 when she died. And it's not lost on me that today, April 28th, is International Workers Memorial Day, where the world pauses to recognize those who have been injured or killed on the job. And so I, I certainly wanted to put that in the room because it is an auspicious day. And again, it's not lost on me that today would be my official introduction as a new member of the Chemical Safety Board. As has already been stated, I've had a long career in various aspects of workplace health and safety. And much of that time has been spent working for labor unions. And my work in health and safety, particularly when I was at the UAW, I feel like we had a number of successes. And part of that success was because we worked jointly with management to figure out ways to make changes that ensured that workplaces were safer for our members. So it's, it's, it's vitally important to me that the people and the public and the environment are protected as we do our work at this agency. And in particular, the workers are the ones on the front lines and often in harm's way. And so I, I want to be able to work towards continuing to have safer workplaces because I believe that America's workers should go to work knowing that they will return home safely. Again, I'm excited and honored to be a member of the Chemical Safety Board, and I look forward to doing my part to meet the agency's mission. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Chairman Lemos. Thank you, Member Johnson. I really appreciate uh, your, both of your personal comments. Again, um, we thank President Biden, you already have, but I also do for nominating new members 
and we thank the Senate for their duty and the consideration of those members for confirmation. Additional perspectives, backgrounds, and specialties will serve to strengthen our agency, and I look forward to working with yourselves or to continue working with yourselves. We have so much to accomplish. So with that, I will now turn the meeting over to Senior Advisor and Executive Counsel, uh, Mr. Lassert. Mr. Lassert, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman Lemos. As the Chairman stated, I am David Lassert. I serve as Senior Advisor and Executive Counsel, and I'm also filling in as the General Counsel. First, I'd like to note that we have successfully onboarded two new investigators since our last business meeting, and they are quickly acclimatizing. We do plan on advancing a new round of investigative hiring shortly, and we also intend to recruit for multiple recommendation specialists. Our newly hired managing director, Susan Kantrowitz, will be further developing the agency's staffing plan. Managing Director Kantrowitz most recently comes from the NTSB and has extensive federal experience to include decades at the EPA. You'll certainly be hearing more from Ms. Kantrowitz in future meetings. All postings will be on USA Jobs. I would also like to note that our mission staff to include investigators and recommendation specialists are being recruited and filled as nationwide postings with remote work availability. This will allow our investigative ranks to be filled from larger applicant pools, will better position the agency to meet diversity and inclusion goals, and will allow for geographic diversity to better meet our mission and respond more quickly to chemical incidents. We have recently hired a new chief information officer, and we will soon advance on postings for new IT staff. With this influx of new talent, we, better, we hope to better modernize and adapt IT best practices to innovate and better support our mission. I am very pleased to mention that our budget request for FY23, while not fully funded at the requested amount, does reflect a modest increase over our annualized FY22 appropriations. As the chairman stated, we're grateful for the bipartisan support which we receive from our partners in Congress. As you can see, we're making great strides here at the agency with our mission. We know this impacts stakeholders across the government, across industry, with the workforce, and with a number of non-governmental organizations. We're happy to enjoy bipartisan support, but we absolutely must increase our output. As we do so, the agency looks forward to continuing our dialogue on how to achieve our mutually beneficial outcomes with all stakeholders and partners. While we did not receive any public comments prior to today's meeting, we do look forward to providing the public with these updates. And comments are always welcome at public at csb.gov which we will attempt to address at each quarterly business meeting. I can also be reached personally at david.lacert at csb.gov if anyone would like to discuss a matter personally. I wanna thank Dr. Lemos for the opportunity to serve. I wanna thank all of our CSB staff yet again for their hard work and dedication to our agency and to our mission. I'll now hand the meeting over to Executive Director of Investigations and Recommendations, Mr. Kleist. Thank you, Mr. Lacert. I'd like to again highlight the postings for our new investigator positions should be on the usajobs.gov website soon. Next, I'd like to discuss our ongoing investigation closure schedule goals. In our ongoing commitment to increase the CSB's transparency, we have posted a calendar on the CSB website of our goals to complete open investigations for consideration by the board. We will highlight and update those goals quarterly with each business meeting. The decision criteria for the completion of investigations is based on the ability and urgency to affect safety change, technical complexity of the incident, the amount of time to recover, inspect and conduct testing of critical evidence, as well as the availability of the investigative staff. The schedule assumes flexibility in order to complete uh, compl our completion based on the factors outside of our control, such as unsafe structures, cooperation of third parties, site contamination, or if we identify a high priority incident that is ready for release and needs to be moved up in the queue. Applying this criteria will ensure reports are completed with the requisite integrity, even if it means that there may be a delay in issuing a report. The investigations we plan to complete for the board's review prior to the end of the fiscal year include the Loilang Box Company investigation, Philadelphia Energy Solutions investigation, 
the Karari eval investigation, Sinoco logistics investigation, the Watson manufacturing and grinding investigation, as well as the intercontinental terminals company investigation. These investigations scheduled for completion in fiscal 23 for the board's review are slated to include the TPC group and Husky superior refinery investigations with the remainder of the investigations for consideration in the remainder of the fiscal year when the investigations move to later stages of review. We look forward to the completion of investigations for board review now that all of the investigations are signed to active investigators and are progressing through the board's review process for conclusion. Finally, I'd like to recognize the outstanding efforts to close safety recommendations over the past year. Our recommendation staff has worked hard to take these recommendations from our investigations to implement them into industry with regulators, uh, with the regulators and with the state and local governments to impact positive safety change. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Chuck Barbie, our Director of Recommendations. Uh, Mr. Barbie, if you would proceed, please. Thank you, Executive Director Kleist. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by, uh, by going over some of those recommendation stats that we spoke about. Um, if we could get the slides rolling. OK. Um, and I had talked uh, last time uh, about that most elusive number, and we finally hit it. And so that's the first thing I'm going to highlight. Um, out of 841 wrecks, we have closed 774 and finally hit the magic number of 90%. This is something that's been a goal of uh, the Office of Recommendations now for <laughs> at least five years, I promise you. Um, and so with 777 or 774 closed, there are 87 open. And so we're going to talk about the, uh, the successes of the, the closed ones first. The, um, the diamond standard is exceeds recommended action. We don't give those out very often. You have, to, you have to go way over and above, come up with something innovative, that kind of thing in order to get that status. And so we've only done that 21 times in our history, which is 2%. Acceptable action is the target. That's what we want. That's what we want everybody to do. And as you can see from the, the, the number 580, we're hitting that pretty regularly, and that's at 69%. And then acceptable alter alternate action. Um, sometimes that is between exceeds and acceptable action, and sometimes it's uh, a little bit below acceptable action, and sometimes it's just different. Um, what that does is it gives us the opportunity, if we may perhaps were a little bit too prescriptive in our recommendation, and the recipient comes back with something either better than what we wanted or at a minimum different, this gives us the opportunity to still positively recognize them. Like I said, sometimes it's better than what we wanted. Sometimes it's just different. Sometimes it's not quite there, um, but it just doesn't reach that exceeds level and it's not, it doesn't hit exactly what we asked for. So, uh, and we, that we've, we've seen that 40 times in our history, which is at 5%. Um, now, occasionally uh, we issue a recommendation and based on the recipient's feedback uh, or maybe some other issues or some things that the board agrees with as, uh, as the reasoning, sometimes we walk that recommendation back and, and, and that's what we call reconsidered. Um, the other part of that is superseded. Occasionally when we are dealing with um, an issue that where we've issued a recommendation to the same recipient and, and it looks like we're going to issue the same thing but maybe modify it just a little bit we will supersede the old one and issue the new one because we don't double up on recommendations um so what we'll do is we'll add that little bit and then it becomes superseded and that's what that status really is and in our history we've done that 24 times or only three percent also occasionally, sometimes, sometimes things change or businesses, sometimes they go out of business and basically something, something happens so that the, the recommendation is no longer applicable and that's when we would apply something like this. And we've done that 63 times in our history. Now this, uh, this last closed status, this is one of those ones that we, we really hate to see happen. 
um, unacceptable action or no response received. Basically in a three to five year period, if we've never gotten a response from the recipient, we know we're, we're, we're communicating with them constantly, um, we'll close it out for this reason. The other option on there is that they've come back and they said, yeah, we're not gonna do that. It happens occasionally. And we look at that as it's a loss for safety. So we, I mean, we really reach out and try to coordinate and collaborate with our recommendation recipients to make sure this does not happen. But um, occasionally does. And as you see in 46 times in our history, that's happened or 5%. Uh, the last three statuses are open. Um, open acceptable response. That's basically, um, we've sent out the recommendation. The recipient says, yeah, we're gonna do it. It's probably gonna take us about three months. And, and it's, it's very, very, it's going to happen. So when we do that, we give them that acceptable response or alternate response. And th that's what we call advancing the recommendation. It's moving forward in a positive direction. Um, immediately after an investigation is voted on by the board or accepted, this, they, they go into a, an awaiting response or evaluation approval of response uh, status. That basically, that's the first status of every recommendation ever issued. It's, it, we're in a waiting period until the recipient responds. And again, occasionally we advance things in a negative direction. And so if the recipient says, we're not gonna do it, or they, they haven't responded, this is a, a status that says, we're gonna leave it open and we're gonna, we're gonna continue to try to convince you or communicate with you. And that's what this status is. Um, we, like I said, we really don't like to go with closed and acceptable. So we will put a lot of effort and like I said, we'll put it here almost as a warning. This is, this is your last chance. Please, please, please uh, implement this, this recommendation. And so that's what that status is for. And we've, we've only done that 10 times or 1%. Next slide, please. Okay, now here's, here's sort of a report card on us. Since, uh, so in fiscal year 21, we closed a total of 41 investigations, 20, 28 were acceptable, three were reconsidered or no longer applicable and 10 were unacceptable. As the last, uh, at the last meeting, the numbers I, I presented are, uh, we closed 16, nine were acceptable, two reconsidered, no longer applicable, or, and five were un unacceptable. As of, Tuesday of this week, uh, our board has closed 32 recommendations and 22 of those are acceptable. Uh, five are reconsidered and no longer applicable and five were unacceptable. And I anticipate based on the numbers that we've got in the, in the hopper right now, um, we will exceed fiscal year 21. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is highlight five recommendations that were issued from three CSB investigations. And if we can go to the next set of slides, please. Uh, first, from the gas will blow out fire at Prior Trust Well 1H9 investigation published back in 2019, Senior Recommendation Specialist Mark Kasniak will highlight R5 to API and R8 to Patterson UTI. Then from the Tesoro Finery Fatal Explosion and Fire Investigation published back in 2014, I will highlight R14 to Marathon Petroleum Corporation. Now, they were formerly the Tesoro Refining and Marketing Company, um, but I had, things, had, you know, things change. And so uh, they're, they're now oper operating under uh, Marathon. And then lastly, from the Chevron Refinery Fire Investigation published in 2015, I will highlight R27 to API, R36 to Contra Costa County, and R37 to the city of Richmond. So without further hesitation, Senior Recommendation Specialist Mark Kasniak will begin with uh, the first two recommendations. Thank you, Director Barbie. Today I will be highlighting two recommendations from the prior trust uh, gas well blowout and fire investigation. The first recommendation was issued to the American Petroleum Institute and the second recommendation to the Patterson UTI Drilling Company, LLC. Yet before I discuss the recommendations and the actions that taken to resolve them, 
Now here is a brief overview of the prior trust incident. On January 22, 2018, a blowout and rig fire occurred at the prior trust gas well number 1H9 located in Pittsburgh County, Oklahoma. The fire fatally injured five workers who were inside the driller's cabin on the rig floor. They died from thermal burn injuries and smoke and soot inhalation. The blowout occurred during three and a half hours after removing drill pipe, a process known as tripping out of the well. The cause of the blowout and rig fire are the, were the failure of the, both the primary barrier, which was the hydrostatic pressure generated by the drilling mud, and the secondary barrier, which is namely human detection of the influx and adherence and, sorry, and adoption of the blowout preventer, activation of the blowout preventer, which are both intended to be in place to prevent blowouts. As a result of this investigation, the CSB uh, issued 19 recommendations. The, one of the recommendations with, issued to API was to address uh, the protection of offshore workers from the hazards of fire and explosion as a result of the blowouts. We are highlighting this recommendation because the API, as a result of this recommendation, issued a new broad-based um, addendum to one of their recommended practices, which addressed the, the, the issue of uh, the fire hazards to the personnel on the rig and, and during the blowout situations. This the implementation of this recommendation goes a long way in assuring that rig, rig workers will continue to go home safely every night as they continue to work on the rigs. As a result of the API's actions, the, C the board voted to change the status of this recommendation to closed acceptable action. The second recommendation that I'm going to discuss is the, is the recommendation to uh, Patterson UTI to develop and implement an alarm philosophy and alarm rationalization for various types of rig operations. This was recommended to the API because they were the contractor who, uh, who was involved in drilling and uh, well control operations of the prior trust well. The response that Patterson API, a UTI, that Patterson UTI provided to the CSB was extremely noteworthy due to its impactful nature and the, and the, the large uh, footprint in the offshore in the onshore drilling industry that a, that a, the Patterson API presents. Patterson API took a holistic approach to the issue of both alarm fatigue and alarm overload, namely nuisance alarms by integrating the uh, alarm philosophy directly into their safety management systems. As a result of their actions, the board voted to change the status of the recommendation to closed acceptable, acceptable alternative action. Uh, I will now hand the presentation back to the Director of Recommendations, Chuck Barbie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Recommendation Specialist Kaznak. Um, and just quickly, uh, you know, as, as that, last, uh, that last investigation, prior trust is one of my favorites. 
And Patterson UTI, they they come they they have bent over backwards to make sure that um, they implemented the recommendations. And this was the last of the recommendations that were issued to them. So um, didn't want to say good job, Patterson UTI. Um, the next highlighted recommendation comes from the Tesoro Finery Fatal Explosion and Fire Investigation. And here's a brief overview of the incident. October, uh, I'm sorry, on April 2nd, 2010, a catastrophic heat exchanger rupture at the Tesoro and a quarters refinery fatally injured seven workers. Our investigation concluded that the incident was caused by a damage hazard mechanism known as high temperature hydrogen attack or HTHA. The site relied on weak safeguards, which did not consider the use of inherently safer piping materials. As a result of the incident, the CSB issued 16 recommendations. And one of the reasons we tell you how many recommendations we issued, this, this really goes to the severity of some of the things that are happening. Um, so in this case, 16, and, and that's, that's, a good, that's a good solid number. Uh, the recommendation in this case addressed improvements to the process safety management system to better identify hazards in order to prevent future incidents. We highlighted this recommendation due to its direct impact on hazard identification and incident prevention, which, been, which was applied at all of the Marathon refineries. So it, it had a big impact. Additionally, there were a lot of specific requirements in the recommendation that included the, such things like the incorporation of inherently safer technology and hierarchy controls. In fact, this recommendation, it specifically had 13 subparagraphs, A, through M. Marathon implemented them all. And as such, in our view, their programs are exceptional and an example for the petrochemical industry to emulate. As a result of their actions, the board voted to change the status of this recommendation to closed acceptable action. The remaining three recommendations that we're going to highlight come from the Chevron refinery fire investigation. The first recommendation was issued to the American Petroleum Institute. The second and third recommendations were issued to Contra Costa County and the city of Richmond, both in the state of California. Before I discuss the recommendations and their actions taken to resolve them, here is a brief overview of the incident. On August 6, 2012, the Chevron refinery in Richmond, California, experienced a catastrophic pipe failure in a crude unit causing the release of flammable hydrocarbon processed fluid. The fluid partially vaporized into a large cloud. 19 Chevron employees engulfed by the vapor cloud escaped, narrowly avoiding serious injury. The ignition and subsequent continued burning of the hydrocarbon processed fluid resulted in a large plume of unknown particulates and vapor, and approximately 15,000 people from the surrounding area medical treatment in the weeks following the incident. So it was a big one. As a result of this incident, the CSB issued 37 recommendations. Now, this particular recommendation was issued to API and promoted awareness of increased rates of sulfida or sulfidation corrosion occurring in low silicon carbon steel, which was determined to be the probable cause of the incident. Additionally, it referenced other API documents that provided guidance on conducting component inspections or pipe replacement where this condition may exist. Now, API is one of, um, one of our recommendation recipients that, that they're a go-to group. The, the, we've issued more recommendations to that particular group than, than any other. And the reason being is that their recommended practices and standards are broad reaching. They, they just impact so much, and, and, and they also have that same philosophy as us about safety. So, um, so we don't issue them because they're not doing what they're supposed to. They're, they're getting these words out, these messages of safety and, um, and these safety actions. So the implementation of this recommendation really brings awareness of the catastrophic damage mechanism to the entire refining industry and provides strategy to potentially prevent future incidents. In short, hazard awareness and corrective action uh, prevent incidents and save lives. And, then, and that's what they're, we're in the business of doing as well as them. So as a result of their actions, the board voted to change the status of this recommendation to closed acceptable action. 
The second and third recommendations that are being highlighted uh, from the Chevron refinery fire investigation were issued to Contra Costa County and the city of Richmond, the county and city in California where the Chevron refinery was located. Um, now it was recommended that Contra Costa County and the city of Richmond each revise their regulations to require petroleum refineries to have a process safety culture continuous improvement program that includes publicly available safety culture audits and a diverse oversight committee. Now, though not as broad reaching as federal or state regulations, county and city regulations are the next level of geographic regulatory jurisdiction and are sometimes more expedient in, in implementing regulations than their federal and state counterparts. Of particular note was the collaboration between the county and the city and the inclusion of other community industry segments to get the best possible outcome. Process safety culture surveys with proper oversight drive continuous improvement, which in turn drives safety, reduces incidents, and saves lives. As a result of their collaborative actions, the board voted to change the statuses of these two recommendations to closed acceptable alternative actions. Uh, I thank you, Chairman Lemos and the board for allowing me the opportunity to highlight these extremely impactful safety regulations. I love talking about them. And with that, I will pass the, uh, the presentation back to Mr. Lissert. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kleist, Mr. Barbie, and Mr. Kasniak. I'd again like to recognize and thank staff in advancement of these safety recommendations. The work of our recommendation staff often goes overlooked by those unfamiliar with our agency and I'd like to point out their efforts in driving our mission. Finally, I'd like to thank the work of the communication and animations team, Hillary Cohen and Shauna Lawhorn in advancing these two latest safety videos for Evergreen and AB Specialty Silicones. These incidents tragically claim the lives of workers and their companies, and it is our hope that these safety videos will demonstrate the lessons learned in an easy to understand fashion, so that the mistakes are not repeated and the tragedy is not repeated. Today, we'll show a short animation and the full safety video is available on our website and YouTube channel. Host, please begin the video for AB Specialty Silicones. AB Specialty Silicones manufactures silicone products used in a wide variety of applications, from personal care to roof coatings for distribution worldwide. One of those products is an emulsion commercially sold as Andesil EM652, which is used as a waterproofing agent. AB Specialty manufactured EM652 using a batch process. It was produced in a part of the facility known as the Low Bay Emulsions Area. On May 2nd, First shift operators started the process to manufacture the first of two back-to-back -back batches of EM-652. They obtained a form called a batch ticket, which detailed the operation steps. For the first batch, the operators staged the chemical ingredients used to make EM-652, including a polymer known as Andesil XL10. The operators then followed the steps outlined in the batch ticket to manually add and mix the chemical ingredients in a tank inside the production building. The operators then delivered two sequential product samples to AB Specialty's Quality Control Department. The QC department found the pH of both samples of the first batch to be too low and in both cases required the operators to increase the pH of the batch by adding a solution of 10% potassium hydroxide in water. The operators brought drums of the 10% potassium hydroxide into the emulsions area and added the necessary amount to the first batch of EM652 product. A third sample delivered to the QC department revealed that the pH was correctly adjusted and the first batch of EM652 was approved for packaging. Sometime before 8 p.m. on May 3rd, a second shift operator likely obtained the batch ticket with instructions for how to produce the second batch of EM-652. This batch required the use of eight drums of XL-10. 
There were also likely two or three drums containing 10% potassium hydroxide remaining in the emulsions area. As a result, there were up to 11 nearly identical drums containing both XL10 and 10% potassium hydroxide in the production area. The operator added the first two ingredients to the batch tank, which included XL10. But at some point, while completing the initial steps, the operator likely misidentified the 10% potassium hydroxide drums that remained in the area for XL10 and incorrectly added potassium hydroxide to the tank. Potassium hydroxide is highly reactive with chemicals that contain silicon hydride bonds, such as XL10. The reaction of these chemicals rapidly produces flammable hydrogen gas. Shortly after the chemicals were mixed, the contents of the tank started to foam and overflow onto the floor. The operator began to yell, and several additional workers ran to the emulsions area in response. A fog also formed, which spread through the low bay. The workers did not realize the material released during the upset was hazardous, and there were no functioning gas detectors to warn them to the dangers of the hydrogen gas. The workers did not evacuate the building. Two operators were directed to ventilate the building, but before they could take effective action at about 9.35 p.m., the hydrogen gas ignited, causing an enormous explosion and fire. Four AB specialty workers lost their lives, and another was injured. The manufacturing building was completely destroyed. Thank you. And uh, to Dr. Johnson's comments earlier, I want to acknowledge the families of the victims in that tragic accident. Uh, I want to also thank all the investigative um, and animation staff um, in charge of the investigative report and the safety, vi safety video for AB Specialty Silicones, especially the investigator in charge, Anzella Vincent. We'd also like to feature another animation today that we released a couple weeks ago from Evergreen, a report that closed earlier which features important safety topics such as confined space safety, hot works, and simultaneous operations. Another special thank you and recognition goes to the IIC. Drew Sali, host, please play the video. During September 2020, the Evergreen Packaging Paper Mill was undergoing a planned shutdown during which maintenance work was occurring throughout the facility. In one of the mill's units, a contract company known as Blastco was performing repairs in a vessel called an upflow tower. Another contract company, Rimcor, was working in a different vessel called a downflow tower. The two vessels were connected at the top by a large diameter pipe. Blastco was tasked with repairing approximately 30 feet of the inside surface of the upflow tower, which was made of a material comprised of fiberglass matting and epoxy vinyl ester resin, otherwise Video known problem. as fiber. Yeah. Um... I think we can acknowledge a video that's available on our YouTube channel. Uh, our host is having a slight technical difficulty here today. Um, that was released a couple weeks ago. Um, it's, very, it's a very impressive piece of video for, uh, for many safety reasons, uh, as I've mentioned. We'll go ahead and reference that as being available um, on our website and on our YouTube channel for additional uh, review. So with that, uh, you can uh, go ahead and take a look at that there. Um, and I think that wraps us up. I also want to uh, recognize the families of those workers lost in the Evergreen tragedy as well. Um, and with that, uh, I believe, Dr. Lemos, uh, the floor is yours to close. Oh, and you're on mute. Okay, yeah, Chairman. Technology. I believe there are 222 participants, many of which I can see on this gallery view. Um, 
And so just for everybody there, there we're not all staff, but thank you all for participating. Um, I want to again, thank our dedicated staff for their contributions here today. The investigators and recommendation specialists are critical to our mission. But I would also like to extend my gratitude to the employees who provide the very foundation for CSV operations in DC and across the country. Um, it looks like it says unmute myself. Am I, am I being heard? We can hear you fine. Okay. All right, it's, this is a big, big flash on the screen. So the CSB simply cannot do its job without employees. You recruit and hire the services that you and equipment that you help finance and procure, the reviews and opinions you draft and deliver, and the IT communications and board support you provide every day. All of us share a strong interest and commitment in preventing chemical accidents in the future. Once again, though we must remain true to our mission in conducting and issuing independent and objective analysis and recommendations, it is important to consider the expertise, knowledge, and priorities of our stakeholder community. We encourage you to join us virtually for the board meeting next week and to look out for our upcoming announcements for board meetings to close out investigations and upcoming business meetings every quarter as well. So with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.